victorious in battle from one end of Europe to the other. He outwitted, outmarched and outfought every one of his enemies. In an age when soldiers were mere pawns, one of the secrets to his astonishing success lies in the nickname his soldiers gave him, Corporal John. At the very beginning of the 18th century, the great powers of Europe regarded the British as being very dubious allies. The soldiers were ferociously brave, but far too often they were led by generals of extraordinary stupidity. And then along came John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough. I'm Major Gordon Corrigan, and I've spent most of my adult life as a soldier. I've always been fascinated by military leadership. In many ways, Marlborough's a bit of a puzzle. He was over 50 before he achieved a major victory. He was stripped of command twice, and he ended his life very much out of favor. So was he a simple soldier intrigued against by scheming politicians, as he himself claimed, or was he in fact a flawed genius and his own worst enemy? Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire, a magnificent home and a gift from a grateful nation to John Churchill the first Duke of Marlborough, following one of the greatest military victories of all time. Few have had such a breathtaking and lasting memorial bestowed upon them. The palace was fittingly named Blenheim after the battle of the same name. The Battle of Blenheim on the 13th of August, 1704, when Churchill beat the French in southern Germany, was his greatest triumph. It was acknowledged as a wonder of the age. And crucially, it shifted the balance of power in Europe and indeed in the world. John Churchill was born into turbulent times. The country had recently fought a bitter civil war and King and Parliament were still jockeying for power. Abroad, Britain was engaged in a deadly game with Europe's other great powers, the Dutch and the French. At the age of 16, John was appointed a page to the Duke of York, the future King James II. He was dashing, he was good-looking, and he had an affair with Barbara Villiers, the mistress of King Charles II. The king was a pretty relaxed sort of fellow, and when he caught John at it, he forgave him on the grounds that you only did it to get your bread. It wouldn't be the last time Churchill would betray his king. From the beginning of his career as a soldier, he was fiercely ambitious. Luckily for him, he had experience early on that would prove formative. England was temporarily allied with France, and Churchill was sent to serve under Marshal Turenne, one of the greatest French generals of all time. On one occasion, the French lost a pass to the Dutch. Turenne turned to another French general and bet him that his English captain could recapture the pass using half the number of men that had lost it. Churchill duly took the pass and Turenne won his bet. Churchill learned two important lessons from Turenne. Firstly, surprise. Turenne was a master at moving armies quickly and in complete secrecy. And the other was the decisive stroke. Many of Turenne's contemporaries were hesitant and cautious, but Turenne believed in getting the killing blow in. Ironically, it was from a French general that Churchill learned how to defeat French armies. In 1685, James II came to the throne. As his one-time page, Churchill would benefit from having friends in high places. With such a powerful patron, Churchill was in a very strong position. 
But these were turbulent times, and he soon began to play a dangerous game. James II was a Roman Catholic, and he was widely suspected of trying to turn England Catholic too. The Dutch Protestant, Prince William of Orange, landed at Tor Bay on Guy Fawkes Day 1688, determined to overthrow the king. King James thought Churchill was his loyal servant, but in fact he was secretly plotting against him. This may not sound very admirable, but it shows Marlborough the political operator, and it's part of the flexibility that ensured his survival as a successful commander, although I think he'd have been an even greater commander if he'd managed to keep his nose out of politics. King James II was the man who gave John Churchill his first position in court. He looked after him, he promoted him, he'd ennobled him, he'd given him valuable canvases, and yet Churchill's in contact with William of Orange. Well, that's well, treason, isn't it? Well, it is indeed. I mean, Marlborough walked away from the person to whom he owed loyalty. Um, you see it here, for example. Here he is in a, uh, a painting of him as the youngest colonel in the army, a commission given to him uh, by James, as with many others, right up to lieutenant general. Um, uh, the difficulty, however, was that in Marlborough's time, uh, the concept of loyalty was different uh, from now. They would be loyal to ideals rather more than to personalities. And so the ideal of national stability uh, overcame the notion of loyalty to James, I'm afraid. So do you think it really was concern for the Protestant religion, as Marlborough always claimed, or was it purely self-interest? Who can say? Historians interpret it in various ways. But I think one thing dominates any kind of evaluation of Marlborough and his life is he was extraordinarily good at being on the winning side, at backing the right horse, if you like. Marlborough could see there wasn't national support for James, and so Marlborough did what he was awfully good at. Again, he backed the right side. Great men are not necessarily decent men, but this was ingratitude of the worst sort. In deserting his patron in his hour of his most desperate need, Churchill was motivated by pure self-interest, ambition, and a determination to be on the winning side, come what may. Now, those aren't the qualities of a great commander. But they don't necessarily detract from him either. Whatever one may hope, leadership and morality don't necessarily go hand in hand. Jumping ship paid off. Churchill became the Earl of Marlborough in what became known as the Glorious Revolution, when James II was replaced on the throne by his daughter Mary and her husband William, Prince of Orange. Marlborough, commanding multinational armies in Ireland and Flanders, now demonstrated another skill that marks him out as a great commander, his ability to work with allies. But William didn't entirely trust Marlborough. After all, he turned his coat once, and he might easily do so again. And he was influential at court, largely due to his wife. Marlborough had married Sarah Jennings for love, but it also turned out to be a useful marriage. For Sarah wasn't only the lady-in-waiting to Princess Anne, heir to the throne after William and Mary, but also her closest friend. In his choice of wife, Marlborough, the canny political operator, guaranteed his influence in the corridors of power. Sarah was, of course, a lady ahead of her time. She was a 21st century woman in the 18th century. She had an independence of mind and a strength of character which, if you like, set her free. So, therefore, not only was she uh, a huge lover of Marlborough, a passionate lover of her between them, but also she, she, she was a strength to him in her great friendship with them, in her position at the centre of London society where she controlled the political situation, the financial situation, to make sure that his actions were based on a firm foundation. And so there was tremendous influence, if you like, being exercised in the corridors of power. Also, of course, the political situation was very uncertain. There were those who were for Marlborough, those who were not for him. So Sarah, again, was in position to keep her eye very closely on, on, on those matters. A hugely important influence, yes. Can't be overstated, I think. So perhaps an example of the old adage that behind every good man stands a good woman. Well, in this case, without doubt. Marlborough seemed on the threshold of great achievements. And then, quite suddenly, 
Everything that Marlborough had gained since the Glorious Revolution was taken away. It would be 10 years before he held a military command again. John Churchill, now Earl of Marlborough, was a senior general in the English army. He'd betrayed one king, James II, and switched his allegiance to another, William III, to secure his own future. But now he was accused of plotting to restore James to the throne. Stripped of his rank, he was thrown into the tower. Things looked bleak indeed. Marlborough was out of favour, but then in 1694, everything changed with the death of Queen Mary. She was childless and Princess Anne was now the heir to the throne after William and her greatest friends and advisers, the Marlboroughs, could no longer be ignored. Rank restored and a further promotion to general, life was looking up again for Marlborough. With the death of William in 1702, Princess Anne became Queen Anne. For Marlborough, the golden age was about to begin. 35 years of army service had prepared Marlborough for his greatest challenge, in which his brilliance as a commander of men would be revealed to the world. It was the war of the Spanish succession that was to be Marlborough's finest hour. Essentially, the war was about who should sit on the recently vacated throne of Spain. The British and the Dutch backed an Austrian candidate, the Archduke Karl, while the French had their own claimant. France was already the most powerful country in Europe. In control of Spain as well, she would be a superpower whom nobody could resist. The French invaded Holland, and Marlborough led a 60,000-strong multinational force against them. It was a perfect example of how he put to good use what he had learned from the great Marshal Turenne while serving as a young soldier in France. He used speed and surprise to great effect, but he found it more difficult to deliver the decisive stroke. By astute manoeuvring and incredible speed, Marlborough forced the French to withdraw. But he was often denied the opportunity to annihilate a French army because the Dutch wouldn't allow their troops to fight a pitched battle. They thought it was too risky. They thought you could win without fighting, victory without slaughter. Marlborough knew better. In order to inflict a crushing defeat on the French, Marlborough, now a duke, realised he needed to meet them head on. But he couldn't do it alone. In a move straight out of Turenne's textbook, he decided to abandon the Dutch and join up with his Austrian ally, Prince Eugène, and his army in Germany. With a combination of logistical brilliance, speed and surprise, Marlborough moved the whole of his army 300 miles from Flanders to here in southern Germany over bad roads and in worse weather. So how was he able to do this? He set up a chain of supply depots along the route so that his men were always well fed and well equipped. They marched for six hours a day, starting before first light, so that they avoided the hottest hours. Marlborough understood that an army marches on its stomach. Soldiers who are exhausted, hungry or badly equipped won't be at their best when it comes to fighting. By looking after his men, he earned their loyalty and they were far more effective soldiers. Marlborough also understood the importance of allies and he now tried to force the Elector of Bavaria, an ally of the French, into coming over to his side. He went about it in a ruthless way unleashing his cavalry in a rain of terror across the countryside. But this wasn't the typical mindless pillaging of previous armies. Marlborough's soldiers were a highly effective, well-led and disciplined fighting force. So what do we know about the effect on the villagers around here? There are many eyewitness accounts. Uh, some you find in local records. And there's a specially interesting one here at Lutzingen in the parish record of 1704, the actual parish register. It was compiled by the parish priest then here at Lutzingen. And he had watched events from the tower of Lutzingen Church from St. Michael's. He'd overlooked the battlefields and his own village, and he saw it burn to the ground. 
and many villages and many, many the villagers lost their homes, they lost their crops, they lost their livelihoods, and many had to move out. What are your views on Marlborough's reign of terror in the area? Because it was a reign of terror. It is very difficult to come to terms with that. He's a man I admire, but that's a very difficult, very difficult part of his life. It was for him a strategic necessity. If he had succeeded with it, actually, the Battle of Blenheim would never have been fought. But Marlborough's pressure didn't work. The Elector of Bavaria remained an ally of the French, and now it would all come to a head in battle. Marlborough had shown strategic brilliance in getting his men to Germany, but he was also a master tactician on the battlefield. Nothing exemplifies this more than the Battle of Blenheim. Here in the village of Tapfein, Marlborough climbed to the top of the church tower from where he could see the French camped near the village of Blenheim. From the church tower in Tapfein, Marlborough and his ally, Prince Eugène, looked down on 56,000 French and Bavarian troops. 4,000 more than the Allies had. The French and Bavarians were spread out with their right flank on the Danube over here, running through the village of Blindheim and Obergau, and then away off to the left. The villages of Lutzingen on the left flank and Blindheim on the right were occupied by French infantry. They'd spent the morning barricading the villages in anticipation of an attack. But Marlborough spotted a gap between the woods, which are here, and the Danube. It's called the Schwenigen Gap, and the French had failed to hold it. So Marlborough sent a brigade forward to take the gap. That night, the Allied armies camped around Tapwein. Next morning, the Allies fed through the gap. Prince Eugène took his Austrians way off to the Allied right. <laughs> While Marlborough attacked the French right flank and the French center. By doing this, the Allies made the French think that a pincer movement was coming in, and so they reinforced their right and left flanks. Ah! Marlborough had cleverly anticipated that this would cause the French to pour more and more infantry into the villages, leaving the French troops in the middle exposed. When the French had no reserves left, Marlborough launched his cavalry straight up the middle, through the French centre, broke the French line, and then between them, he and Prince Eugène pinned the remaining French against the Danube, and those that weren't drowned trying to get away were either killed or captured. Marlborough had delivered the annihilating blow that everyone had been avoiding for so long. It was a devastating and total victory. The French lost 39,000 men killed, wounded, and taken prisoner, as opposed to about 12,000 Allied casualties. But more importantly, all of Louis XIV's war aims were blown away on that August day, and it would be another 40 years before French armies could march so far east again. At the age of 54, Marlborough had at last found the fame that he'd always sought. Marlborough relayed the news of a victory that had completely overturned the balance of military power in Europe in a letter to his wife, Sarah, scrawled on the back of a tavern bill. And here it is. I have not time to say more, but to beg you will give my duty to the Queen and let her know her army has had a glorious victory. In an unprecedented act, the British Parliament voted on how they would reward Marlborough for his outstanding victory. Blenheim Palace was his reward from a grateful nation. 
Of course, the Battle of Blenheim wasn't the end of the war. The Duke of Marlborough went on to add more battle honours to the colours of British regiments. Ramillies, Oudenard and Malplaquet. All showed Marlborough's strategic and tactical genius. His ability to get on with difficult allies, his understanding of logistics and his care for the common soldier. They loved him. They called him Corporal John. Then fortune turned again. Queen Anne and Marlborough's wife Sarah fell out. The government changed. Marlborough was accused of prolonging the war for his own personal glory and he was suspected of corruption. He was dismissed from his offices and he never held a military command again. Before Marlborough, British troops were generally badly led, undisciplined, unreliable and inveterate looters. By the time Marlborough had fought his last battle, he had transformed them into the best soldiers in Europe and every other army was terrified of them. It would be another hundred years, not until Wellington, that the British army would reach such heights of professionalism again. A fickle country might take away his rank and his officers, but they couldn't take away the memory of his greatness. For soldiers at least, John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, will always be a great British commander.